Okay, welcome to class. We'll go ahead and get started. We left off last time with an example of what a clicker activity might look like. So we're going to go ahead and finish this one. I didn't bring my calculator today, so I'm going to rely on you guys for some of the calculations. But even though it's simple and you, you should have seen this in chemistry, we're going to review it one more time on how you convert between different things like energies, right? So in this question, I told you that a green laser pointer has a wavelength of 525 nanometers, right? So then I say, what energy will each one of these photons that comes out of that green laser have? The equation was pretty simple. It was just this E equals HC over lambda, right? E equals HC over lambda. We're going to solve for E, our energy, by simply plugging in HC and lambda. However, you need to make sure that you have the same units to make this work out. So there's a bunch of different ways we can do this. We can look up H and C, our Planck's constants, such that they have electron volts as opposed to joules. The energy of an individual photon, since it's so small, it makes sense to use a really small unit of energy, right? Just like you could measure weight in tons or in t like in grams or something. And if you're talking about something small, it makes sense to use grams. We're going to do the same thing in energy. It makes sense to use a small unit of energy, which is an electron volt, right? So we've given you H, Planck's constant, in electron volts times seconds. And then we've given you C, the speed of light, in meters per second. So you could go ahead and plug this in and you'll get the answer in electron volts if you make sure to remember uh, to convert your 525 nanometers to meters, right? Because speed of light is in meters. So if you haven't seen this before, you should remember that these conversions are pretty straightforward. You have 525 nanometers. I think the easiest way to do these is to make these little tables. You remember that, all right, in, uh, in one meter, there is how many nanometers? One times 10 to the nine meters or nanometers, right? Therefore, when you multiply these out, this cancels and you're left with just meters. If you, if you don't remember stuff like unit conversions, please, please, please find one of the TAs during office hours and just say, hey, I know I'm supposed to know this. Can we just go over this and convert between hard stuff? The TAs will teach you how to do it. It's really not so bad, but you need to be able to do that relatively quickly on exams because there's oftentimes unit conversions. So once you plug that in, I think we came up with, does anybody have the number offhand? 2.36, I think that was right from last time. The seconds cancel out. If you make sure to put that in in meters, then it cancels out and you're left with just electron volts. Had I given you Planck's constant in joules, which is another constant, uh, another common way to show it, Planck's constant, they'll give it in all sorts of different units, right? Uh, oftentimes, meter squared, kilogram per second, you can get joules out of that if you go to these things. It'll actually show you a bunch of different ones. The front uh, table, uh, the, there's a table in the front of your book on like the inside cover, I think, that has a lot of these different units for it, whether it's in joule seconds, EVs, right? So make sure that you're using the one that's just most convenient for you. On exams and tests, we don't have to worry about this for a few weeks, but you have a note sheet, so you can write down whatever convenient unit you want to have, right, on there. Okay, so that was the first one. So let's shift gears, and having now introduced the idea that um, energy levels exist, um, and we've even seen evidence of them, right? We took light from the sun or from burning different metals. We saw these things, these spectral lines, right? So we know that different atoms produce way, uh, radiation that comes off with different energies because it shows up as different colors, right? The next question is, how sharp are these lines, right? Right? Do those come from a specific energy? Is there just one energy? Meaning, is there one distance from the nucleus that they come from? And in, in Gen Chem, when you learn about this, you probably learn that they do come from just one specific energy. What do I mean by that? I mean that if you've got your um, atom here, you've got your positive nucleus, and you've got your electrons out here, if you were to plot a distribution of this, um, what I'm suggesting is that instead of having all of your electrons that distance away from your nucleus, you actually have a distribution, right? So they don't lie exactly at some radius from the distance, or some radius from the nucleus. Instead, their average position is at that radius, but they actually are smeared out just a little bit. There's some play there, okay? And the reason for that is because instead of behaving exactly as a particle or exactly as a wave, we have wave mechanical, wave particle duality, basically. You can't describe electrons if you don't treat them a little bit like a particle and a little bit like a wave, right? This was turn of the century stuff that we discovered about quantum mechanics. 
So because of that, we have to introduce quantum numbers, right? To have that wave aspect of how electrons behave, you have to introduce quantum numbers. You've seen this stuff before in chemistry. In high school chemistry, you learn that there's these four quantum numbers. At some point, you should have seen this, that there's N, there's L, M sub L, and M sub S. So what did these things mean, and why do we care about them in this class? We'll be brief with them. We're not going to spend a lot of time, but N is your principal quantum number. What can N be? What were the values that were acceptable? Anybody remember this from high school chemistry? Yeah, N can equal one, two, three integer numbers and you just keep on getting larger, right? So N is allowed to be, starting at one, integer values that increase. It can't be negative numbers, it can't be fractions or anything like that. All right, what can L be? Or azimuthal quantum number, as it's called. Yeah, it can be, it can be zero, one, two, all the way up to whatever n is minus one, right? So it can't be the same. If your n is one, then what is your only allowable l? It can only be zero. If n is two, now you can have l equals zero and one, right? Um, all right, what about m sub l? What can m sub l be? Anybody remember this one? Yeah, negative l. It can be negative l all the way up to positive L. So if M, if, so if, um, if L equals two, then what can our values be? They can be negative two, or M sub L can be negative two, negative one, zero, one, two. Again, maybe you learned about this, and anybody ever wonder like why you're learning this? Does this mean anything to you? I'll explain why we should care about this, how it's actually kind of useful for us. And then finally, the spin quantum number, M sub S, what can it be? Plus or minus one half. Yeah, plus or minus one half meaning your spin can be either spin up, a positive one half, or spin down, a negative one half, right? These things are useful because they explain why our great big periodic table, which we know and love, um, is the way it is, right? Why on earth is the periodic table have this weird shape to it, right? It, it, has, it has to do with these quantum numbers and the allowable values that they can be. Here's how I'm gonna explain it, right? Let's start with n equals one. For our principal quantum number, if n equals one, then we have different shells that we call these. If n equals one, we call that the k shell. I don't know where this came from. It's just the terminology that's sometimes used. So the k shell. So what subshells are allowed in there? If n equals one, the first subshell, let's talk about l. What can l be if n equals one? It can only be zero. If l equals zero, we call that the s subshell, right? Now, how many orbitals can exist in there? If l equals zero, how many values can we have for m sub l? It's just, just one. If, if L equals zero, we can go from negative L to positive L. That's just zero. We only have one value, right? So we have one orbital. And then how many electrons can fit per orbital? You can fit two per orbital, right? Because you can go spin up and you can go spin down, right? Therefore, in that entire shell, you have one orbital that can fit two. We can only fit two in that entire S subshell, right? Fair enough? So let's make it a little bit harder. Let's say the principal quantum number is now two. If n equals two, what can l be? Well, yeah, l can be either zero or one. If it's zero, we still call that the s subshell, but now we introduce a new one. If, if l equals one, we call that the p subshell, right? So zero is right there, one is right there, right? This may be sounding familiar in the periodic table, right? We have the p orbitals, we called these over here. These were called the d orbitals. This is where that comes from, right? So you've got your s and your p. Now s, just like before, it can fit one's orbital, two, right? Now, meanwhile, p, what can the, if, if p corresponds to an l value of l equals one, what can m sub l be? Negative one, zero, positive one. So there's actually three orbitals there, right? Each one of those can hold two, so that's six. Therefore, in that entire n equals two shell, how many electrons can we fit? A total of eight, right? This making sense? Do it on the next one. Now, if n equals three, then L can equal zero, one, or two, which corresponds to S, P, D. Again, we have one and three, just like before, but now how many orbitals will the D subshell have? That corresponds to L equals two, so how many M sub Ls can we have? Five, it's the same five that we did right here, right? Those are the five orbitals, right? So there's five of those. Each one of these things can hold two, so two, six, 10, for a total of 18 in that shell, right? And you could go on and on and so forth, right? The next one, we'll just show one more. If L equals three, 
That corresponds to the F orbital. That can now hold seven orbitals. All right, sorry, the F subshell, seven orbitals and 14 electrons. If you do the math, that comes out to a total of 32. Same stuff as before. 32 electrons, right? This explains the periodic table. How? Well, take a look at our first, first subshell, the 1s1, right? If your principal quantum number is 1, you can have two electrons, right? So you have one element where you have one electron. That's hydrogen. You got another element, helium, where you have two, right? Let's move to our next one. If n equals 2, we're going to have a total of eight elements, right? Here's the first two. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, right? So every one of these different number of protons and electrons, if you have a different one, that's your different elements, right? And so this is why the periodic table takes the funny shape that it has, okay? Why do we learn about them? We'll, we'll show you in just a moment. First off, because we care about how these electrons fill their available states. What do I mean by that? So it's one thing to say, great, you've got oxygen, right? It's got, what, eight electrons. It's got eight electrons, but what happens when you form oxygen two minus ions, right? Like in H2O, in H2O, hydrogen has given up its electron. It's given it to the oxygen, and two of those hydrogens have both given it to the oxygen, so oxygen's picked up two electrons. So it's useful for us to think about where do those electrons go, right? It now has more than it usually has. It's become an ion. It has a charge. So it has to occupy these available states, and that becomes really important when we think about bonding. And that's a very simple example. So let's do some harder ones. Let's think about in the D subshell, right? Th these ones are in the D subshell. So from elements 21 to 30, for example, that's the 3D shell, right? There's 10 of those because we decided that there were 10, right? 10 different uh, electrons we could put in that shell. So if you're something like iron versus manganese, are you going to behave the same? You won't because your, your outermost electrons, the ones that are involved in bonding, they have different energies that they face. And we learn that from how these electrons occupy. So I want you to turn to a neighbor, and if you remember this from high school, uh, jog your neighbor's memory on how do these electrons like to fill the available orbitals, right? If you're gonna take an electron away or add electrons, how do they like to fill it, and are there rules that they must follow? As a hint, you might remember this is called Hun's rules, right? Okay, so turn to your neighbor and chat for a minute. Okay, somebody help me remember, what are some of our rules? If you, uh, anybody remember anything that they feel brave to talk about? Takara, what, what do you remember? Okay, what is the poly exclusion principle? That is absolutely one of them. Yeah, basically, let's say we're talking about this 1s orbital, this one down here, this lower, the lowest one you're gonna fill. Poly exclusion principle basically tells us that if we start putting electrons places, change color, you can't, put a, you can't put a positive spin and a positive spin together, right? That is not allowed. You definitely can't do that. That would violate poly exclusion principle. Poly exclusion principle says instead what you can do is you can put one spin up, one spin down, and you can now no longer have any more electrons in that orbital. And where this comes into really important is if this is an individual atom, let's say this is one helium atom, right? This is helium, it's got two electrons. That's a helium, right? If you bring another helium atom in close contact with this, something we're gonna talk about later today, now you've got the potential for four electrons all occupying something very nearly at the same energy level. That would violate Pauli exclusion principle, right? So because of that, something has to happen. And what happens, we're gonna cover later this semester, there has to be basically a splitting and that leads to all sorts of really cool properties. Okay, what else? Anybody remember other things? Uh, is it Hayden? Yeah. Um... I don't know what the name of this is, but when you're filling the orbitals, you have to place one electron within each orbital before you can yep. fill it. So let's talk about oxygen again, right? Oxygen has eight electrons. So we've got one, two, three, four. We're going to go five, six, seven, and then we go eight, right? That's an example you're saying. So think of it like electrons are exactly like people on a bus. People on a bus, if, they're, if you get on the bus and you're the first person on the bus, you sit wherever you want. You don't care, right? But if you keep on putting people on that bus, the second person, if they choose to sit next to you on the bus and you don't know them, 
it's weird, right? <laughs> and electrons are weird like that. They're socially awkward. They like to spread out, right? So they're never going to pair up if they don't have to. If it's all the same energy level, if it's the same distance for them to walk to this seat versus that, but I'm going to sit uncomfortably close to somebody, they don't do it, right? They're just like people. So basically, you would never have this happen. Does that have eight electrons? Yeah, it does. But that is basically pairing up when you don't have to. Why don't they pair up? Because there's what's called a, there's a coupling energy. When you couple two things together, there's a small energy penalty. And if they don't have to pay it, they won't do it, right? So there's that. And then there's one more rule. Anybody remember one more rule for electrons and how they fill orbitals? There's one more one that's often forgotten. Is it a Brennan? Yeah, if they can arrange themselves to half yep. the orbital, Yep, they want empty orbitals or they want full orbitals or they want half filled. All three of these are preferred. So let me ask you this. Here's our periodic table. You've got manganese and you've got iron right next to each other. And you know, they're not the most dissimilar things, right? But there's some key differences. Let me ask you this. Which one wants to hang on to its electron more? Manganese or iron? Turn to a neighbor and talk about it. Let me pick on the back row. I'm going to pick on Jan in the white shirt. That's you. Is it Jan or Jan? I don't know. I can't even hear you. Okay, so you think based off of charge, right, that manganese has as a smaller nucleus, and so it's got a smaller charge, and so there's going to be some shielding effects. That's one way to think of it. That's not what dominates, though. Let me pick on, is it Aaliyah in the purple scarf? Go ahead. You think iron hangs on more. How come? Okay, similar argument to what Jan was saying, actually. Anybody have a different opinion? Is it Griffin? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it, um, it has an automatic, maybe some automatic electrons, and it has a more, it has more stable pairs, uh, or less stable pairs than iron does, so that it can more easily give away that a valence electron than iron does. Yeah, so if you think of the d orbital, you've got, sorry, in the d shell, I get these mixed up, in the d shell, you've got five orbitals that are all at the same energy level, right? So let's look at iron, or manganese for a minute. Manganese is one, I forget which one is which. Manganese has five. One, two, three, four, five. So that is a half-filled orbital. So it's happy to be there, right? Meanwhile, you've got iron, which looks like that. So iron, if it gets rid of that one electron, it becomes half-filled, which it's pretty happy to be, right? Whereas manganese, if you take away one electron, it goes from half-filled, which it's happy with, to not quite as happy. Now, we're not talking about big differences in energy, but we can see them. If we go back up to here, this was our ionization energy. What are we talking about? We're talking about elements 25 and 26. So right here, 25 and 26. Take a look at that. Do you see how 20, uh, 25 right there? <laughs> this is small. But we're talking about this guy. That one? <laughs> that didn't make it any better. Right? That one, it doesn't want to get rid of it. You had to go it, to strip away that outermost electron, which is to ionize something, costs a little bit more energy than the one before it, right? Because it's at a half-field state. So some of these rules are easy to predict. Some of them are hard to predict, right? But this does give us an idea for how electrons choose to fill different orbitals. Yeah, Hayden? So somebody in my, in my dead chem one class said that the electron and stuff, they'll take that electron and throw it in the next decimal. Ah, we're getting to that. We're getting to that. It's called the Aufbau principle, if anybody speaks German. It's construction, right? So uh, how do we write electron configurations? The very first question on the homework asks this. All it's doing is it's having us write out where the electrons are in different orbitals. You could draw diagrams like this, right? That's certainly accurate, but it's not very concise, you know? So instead, we have a way of writing it. The way that we write it is we write 1s, and then you write a little 2 up here, because there's two electrons occupying that 1s orbital. Then you write 2s, 2, and there's two occupying there. And then in the p, how many p's are there? It's the 2p. How many are in that p orbital for oxygen? 
Yeah, there was four, right? There's a total of four up there. Let me get rid of that so as to not confuse people. All right, so this is electron configuration. Now to make this easier, so and if you do something with only eight electrons, it's not so bad. If you do something that's with got a bazillion electrons, it's easier to do a trick where you look at the periodic table, and if you're talking about, say, selenium, rather than writing out the full thing for selenium, what you can do is you can say that selenium looks just like argon, which is the most recent noble gas before it, plus some other stuff. So let's write out selenium. Or well, what are we doing here? Do chromium, right? Chromium looks just like argon plus these ones. So chromium is going to be argon. You write this in square brackets. So whatever argon is plus, it's going to be 1, 2, 3, 4s, 4s2, and then 3d, I think it's 3, 1, 2, 3, 4. Right Now, I think it was Hayden or somebody mentioned, how do you know whether it does that or if it does something slightly different? Like, is this also possible? Or you could do argon, 4s1, 3d5, right? Because think, like, you're talking about little differences in energy. In this case, you have a full orbital, which is your s orbital, and you have an almost half filled. Meanwhile, over here, you've got a half filled and a half filled. So it turns out, I'm pretty sure in this case, that this one's slightly more stable, right? It's actually slightly more stable to steal one of those four S's and put it in your 3D. Um, I don't expect you to know these things. They're, we're talking about small differences in energy. Um, I'll let you know if it's something unusual like this, I'll have that available on if it was on an exam or something. Are there questions on writing electron configuration? Can I make that clear in any way? Yeah. Yeah, so let's, uh, let's, let's write out the alpha principle. Alpha principle is, is a way of figuring out which one of these things go into. You write it like this. You write 1s, 2s, 2p. You write 3s, 3p, 3d, 4s, 4p, 4d, 4f, right? These are just the available states. And then how does it fill them? This is sort of the trick that some people find useful. I don't know if it's terribly useful, but they fill like this. They fill at a diagonal. You're first going to fill the 1s. When that's full, you now fill the 2s. And then you start to fill the 2p, and then you fill the 3s, right? Then you're going to fill the, uh, I draw this right? Yeah. You're going to fill the 3p and the 4s. Did I mess up? That's right. Yeah, then you'll fill the 3d. Yeah, that's right. And 4p, and you could write the 5s and so forth, right? So that's a, a trick for remembering how these things fill. I don't think it's terribly important. What I'm actually going to hand out, which I've forgotten to do so far, we'll bring it next class period, is we have a really nice periodic table that has the electron configuration written out for all the elements. It doesn't have it for different ion states, right? If, if your element adds or loses electrons, it doesn't have that. But it does have them for the elements, and it has a ton of other really useful information like melting point, density, crystal structure, all sorts of interesting stuff on it. So I'll bring that for next class. Okay, why are we learning about this? We learn about it because it helps us predict how ions bond together. And it teaches us something about uh, what type of bond forms, right? So for example, take iron 2 plus. Iron 2 plus, you start out with iron, it lost two electrons, right? If you looked at the electron configuration for iron, you could take a pretty good guess at what two iron electrons it's gonna lose. Like if iron's right here, what do you guys think? Which two electrons will it lose first? Remember, it's got six electrons, so it's right like this. So it, it's pretty much happy to get rid of this guy, right? So it's going to lose that one. And then it has to choose whether to get rid of this one or to lose one from its 4s, right? And I don't actually remember which one of those, right? But this gives us a clue for what common oxidation states. So if something will easily get rid of three ions and have now an empty shell, then it's common that that ion will form a plus three ion. That makes sense? Let, let's look at the periodic table. Vanadium. Vanadium, what would you expect the common oxidation states to be for vanadium? Plus three by getting rid of these three D, uh, three D electrons. But it could also be plus four and then you'd half fill that. that. I think it probably exists, but it's not common. But you can do plus five. Right? A common uh, valence of uh, vanadium is actually plus five, and that's the most common oxide you can buy it in. It's actually V2O5. So two vanadiums, five oxygens. So this is really helpful for us to figure out what thing's going to form uh, when compounds, right? Now let's do titanium. What will be our common oxidation states for titanium? Two plus and four plus, right? What about um, 
What about copper? What will copper be? Minus two is a good guess. What if it were just like to, what if it were become an anion and pick up electrons as opposed to a cation? Remember, cation is a positively charged ion. Anion is a negatively charged one. So what if it could pick up two? I'm sure that there's actually compounds of copper that form where it does add electrons. But yeah, it's actually usually plus two or plus three, right? So if it loses three, one, two, three, that still doesn't get us there. So it explains some really well and others it doesn't explain super well, right? The two is actually probably these 4s electrons hitting walls first. Um, there's a little bit more to this because this is assuming so far that all of your ions are at the exact same energy level. Something you'll learn about if you take further courses in uh, that deal with chemistry at all is that they're not always at the same energy level. In fact, it depends on what your neighbors look like that surround you. So take Mark here for a minute. Can you raise your hand, Mark? Mark here, how many nearest neighbors do you have? You got left and right, and front and back are pretty much the same, right? So because he has that, what we call a coordination number of four, he's coordinated by four nearest neighbors, that would lead to a different arrangement in terms of your energy levels here than if you were surrounded by, say, three people, or surrounded by two, or six, or eight, right? We'll talk about this a little bit more later on, but um, it's more complicated than this because these are talking about individual atoms that have no neighbors, right? And in just a few moments, we're going to talk about when our first neighbors move in and what happens to atoms, okay? All right, um, there's something called, well, I should mention really quick that you can have Fe2+, and that forms iron oxide, FeO, right? Because oxygen is 2 minus. How do we know that it's 2 minus? Well, we look at our periodic table, and oxygen can easily pick up one, two electrons and have a structure that looks like neon, which it's going to be happy with, right? So it's obviously going to be 2 minus, and in almost all compounds, oxygen is 2 minus, right? So FeO is going to be a one-to-one -one ratio because charge is balanced, right? You had positive 2 from the iron, you had negative 2 from the oxygen, it's balanced. However, you can also make compounds like Fe2O3. Fe2O3, now you've got a total of negative six from your oxygens, so you need to come up with a positive six from your irons, right, to have this thing be balanced. Therefore, your iron is no longer plus two, it's plus three, right? And then even more interesting, you can have mixed oxidation states like um, Fe3O4. You have to come up with a to total of negative eight from your oxygen, so you need a total of positive eight. But how do you get a positive eight from three ions. What's eight divided by three? Not an integer, right? So instead what you have to have is you have to have two of them are three plus and one of them is two plus. That makes sense? Then you've got three plus three is six plus two is eight. So you can have mixed valence in your compounds and they can do even stranger things. But for now, this is just a pretty good way to estimate what compound you form. So if I were to ask you on a test, if I said, what would be, what do you anticipate would be the oxide formula of zirconium oxide? Turn to a neighbor and tell him, what do you think would be the formula for zirconium oxide? Okay, anybody have a thought? Zirconium oxide, let me pick on... I'm trying to remember the name. Okay, I think it's Kristen in the blue shirt. Yeah. Kristen, what do you think? Zirconium oxide, what might be the formula? ZRO is one possibility. Are there other possibilities that might be likely? ZRO2. And uh, the most common one is ZRO2, but you can also form ZRO. You can also form zirconium monoxide. Um, so it's as simple as that, right? Not so bad. All right, next up, let's talk about electronegativity. What does electronegativity mean? Brennan. How likely an atom is to gain electrons? Yeah, it's a measure of how badly your atom or ion uh, wants another electron, right? And what's the general rule of thumb on the periodic table? What does, which of these atoms is really wanting an electron? Fluorine. Fluorine wants an electron real bad. And once it gets it, it's really happy and it doesn't want to be bothered, right? Meaning fluorine compounds, fluorinated compounds, once they do form, they're pretty happy. They don't want to be messed with. That's why things like Teflon, right, which we'll learn about later on, polyfluoro, uh, polyfluoro, tetrafluoro, what am I missing? PTFE, polytetrafluoroethylene, polytetrafluoroethylene, right? It's really, really inert. You can cook with it. Nothing sticks to it. It's really low friction because once that fluorine gets its electron, it doesn't want to let go. It's happy with it. Now, what things are happy to get rid of electrons? Down here, right? They're huge ions. And this, they've got, what? Francium's got 87 electrons. If it loses one, it's like, mm, right? It doesn't really care that much. 
whereas fluorine really wants to complete its shell. So the general rule of thumb is that it increases in this direction on the periodic table, right? Top right corner, top right corner are the most electronegative, bottom left are the least. There's lots of exceptions to this rule, and you can see the exceptions when you look at funny stuff that happens in your ionization energies, right? But that's the general rule. Um, okay, let's talk about why do bonds form? What happens? You've got your oxygen, it's happy. A single oxygen atom floating through the air, you know, that doesn't exist, right? Instead, what does oxygen do in the air? It finds another oxygen and they partner up. So why on earth does this happen, right? Why do bonds form at all? Whether it's oxygen bonded to oxygen or two hydrogens bonded to oxygen to form water, right? Why do these bonds form? It can be best understood if you think about this in terms of energy. So I've drawn here oxygen um, number one, right? Meanwhile, over here, you've got oxygen number two, okay? And if you write them out in energy, increasing energy, these filled up just like we did before. What can happen is if they come together, and remember, when they get close together, you can't have all of uh, these energy levels occupying the same space or you violate the poly exclusion principle, so that cannot happen. So instead what happens is you form bonds. You get bond orbital, orbital hybridization. Can you remember this from chemistry? Instead of having like just a p orbital, you end up with like sp, sp2, sp3. You get these weird things like that. So you get bonds forming or you get band splitting. Here we're gonna have a bond forming. This is how it looks. Instead of these one, two, three, four, five, six orbitals sitting at the same energy level, you're now going to have them split. You're gonna have one, two, three, four, five, six. But you still have to fit all your electrons just like before, right? So where are they gonna to choose to go? Let's, let's place them in there. We've got to, we have to fit eight of these electrons there. So we're gonna do one, two, three, four, five, six. We're gonna put six of our electrons at the lowest energy possible. And then we're gonna take the upper two and we're gonna put seven, eight, right? Now, if you compare, this is the O2 diatomic molecule where two oxygens have just decided to stick together they have decided to stick together because this is lower energy than the two scenarios that are separate, right? Because you went down in energy a little bit. By forming what are called this sigma and pi orbitals, sometimes called the bonding orbitals, right? These ones up here where it's sigma and pi but with little asterisks, those are the anti-bonding orbitals. If we have to, we can put electrons up here, but at best it's going to be just as good as them separate, right? And here, where we have less, we only have eight electrons and we have space for 12 electrons, we actually get an energy bonus. We go down in energy, right? And going down in energy is the reason why everything in this entire universe happens. Things want to lower their energy. If they can lower their energy, then it happens. If they can't, then it won't happen. Rosa? Um, so, uh, those electrons that we just put in the middle, did you pull them? I did. Basically, um, ignore these guys for a moment, and these guys. We're just talking about the 2p orbitals. Each oxygen contributes four electrons from its 2p orbital, right? But we combine both of those orbitals together to create a new type of orbital. This is a bond, right? Those, those three and three, we brought together in a new way where it's like this, like three above, three below sort of thing. And by doing that, we can place them at a lower energy. It went down in energy. That's like... That's what everything wants to do. If it can lower its energy, great. That's like if I tell you, if I t I'm a scout master, and if I take my scouts and I tell them I can say, you can hike at four miles an hour, or you can hike at one mile an hour, they're always gonna choose one mile an hour because they want to expend less energy, right? Atoms are no different. They want to be in the lowest energy state possible, right? Any questions on this? This is a little bit tricky. Let me ask you this. Oh yeah, question in the back. I can't see your face, so I don't know who you are. What does it say up here? That's a sigma, the Greek letter sigma, and then it's got little asterisks by it. The asterisk indicates that this is the same type of, you know, orbital, sigma here and sigma down here, except one is what's called anti-bonding, meaning it doesn't get filled very often because it's higher in energy, right? Vertical is our, is our energy axis here, so those energy orbitals up there don't get filled as often because they cost more energy to do so. Any, any questions on this? All right, let me ask the next question then. Why doesn't... Well, how about this? Oh, I just blew it. I blew it. <laughs> why doesn't, though, why doesn't helium form a diatomic molecule? The first question was, does it form a diatomic or does it stay alone? And then why? Why don't you think helium forms a diatomic molecule like oxygen? Let's draw its thing, right? Let's draw it. Uh, I think I can just create some space here. 
Apologize if your notes don't have the space, right? Here's two different helium atoms, helium number one. Here's helium number two. And they each have two electrons in their 1s orbital, right? So these things could potentially bond. If they did form a bond, you would have, you'd have to split the energy levels. So you'd have one up here, one down here, one, two, three, four. It's no different. It's the same, right? This is right in the middle. So there's no energy benefit for these things to form a bond. So they just don't do it, right? They could temporarily go together and it's not like it's costing them energy, but it's not, there's no benefit, right? And actually it would cost them energy. We'll talk about why in just a moment, but there's no benefit here, right? Can we move on? Are there any questions that I can answer about this? Okay, let's keep going. Bonds between things that aren't of the same type um, they behave similar ways. They have a driving force to come together, right? It, you, if you think in terms of energy, they can go down in energy until a certain point. But before we talk about energy, let's relate that to force because force and energy are related through an integral and a derivative, right? This isn't so bad to do. So let's think about it in terms of force first. So let's draw an axis. We're gonna draw, our vertical axis is gonna represent the force and our x-axis is going to represent the interatomic separation. which we oftentimes just call R, right? The radius between two ions. Meanwhile, this is force. And we're gonna make, arbitrarily, we're gonna choose this. We're gonna say that a positive force is attractive. And negative forces, we'll call those repulsion. Okay, now I need two beautiful people to volunteer. I have two beautiful volunteers. So in the back, in the red shirt, come on down. And then a girl, let's do Emily. Can, you, can I have you volunteer? You're going to make the TA do this. So T, Emily, you'll stand over there. And is it Alex or Zach? Anthony. I'm way off. All right. Oh, Anthony Wardell. Yes, sir. Okay, Anthony. Okay. You guys see each other, and it's love at first sight. <laughs> they experience some massive attraction. And so they're drawn to one another. So go ahead, draw them to one another. <laughs> No one's ever going to volunteer ever. And they stopped. But you're massively attracted. Why did they stop? There's like a bubble, you know? There's a bubble of social comfort. <laughs> right. Especially in front of 200 of your peers. I mean, maybe if I was volunteer, you know, I'd like, never. <laughs> right? There is a little bit of an awkwardness when you get close. Maybe it's like, maybe Emily got close and she's like, that's kind of a patchy beard. It's not as patchy. <laughs> not as patchy as Sparks's, but it's kind of patchy. And he's like, you know, I don't know either. And so actually what happens, if you get too close, you now start to experience a little bit of repulsion. And now you've reached some equilibrium, like you guys haven't moved. You have reached what is called the equilibrium distance. You haven't moved. Okay, thank you, you can take a seat, right? <laughs> Atoms are no different. Atoms, if they are the certain types, meaning a positive and negative, and cation and anion, they will experience an attractive force to one another until a certain point. Now, it's easy to explain why people may not want to get super close because of the whole awkward thing. Why don't atoms want to get too close? What do you think? What's, re what's the repulsion force, Rob? What do you think? Um, I'd say that's probably the nucleus. What about the nucleus? Uh, the nucleus, well, they all occur in each other anyway. Ah, that's an interesting guess. That's not exactly right. That's a great guess. Meaning, like, both those atoms, even though one had a net negative charge, the other had a net positive, they both, deep down in their very interior, have positive nuclei, and maybe that's going to repulse. That's a great guess. It's not exactly right. What do you think, Takara? Because uh, with the poly exclusion principle, with the electrons, they don't want to... Absolutely. Poly exclusion principle. Remember, you've got these two different atoms. As you come closer and closer together, if atoms with electrons at the same energy level start to occupy the same volume of space, that violates an unviolable principle and the universe would end. So therefore, instead of doing that, it starts to have to kick those electrons up to higher and higher energy levels. Nothing likes to go up in energy. So therefore, it just doesn't happen. It, experience, it experiences a strong repulsive force. So let's draw these. Um, the repulsive force, I'll draw it first because it's hard to know what it would... Oh, something weird happening today. Right. So the repulsive force, let's draw it in blue, it's gonna look like this, right? Meaning as you get really, really close together, it takes off, right? If, once you get below a certain point, it really, really takes off to infinity, right? It just gets stronger and stronger the closer you overlap these two atoms. Now, what should the attractive force look like? Anybody have a thought? Should it be what? Maybe turn to a neighbor. Or how about that? Anthony, what do you think? Or kind of like in the 
Y yeah. Who's taken physics? Physics one. You would have seen this, I think. Remind me what Coulomb's law tells us. Does anybody remember Coulomb's law? It's for charged particles, right? Is that physics two? Oh, all right, I'm sorry. Well, Coulomb's law, anybody? Anybody? All right. Uh, uh, Kevin. Kevin. Force equals K, a constant, times Q1, Q2 over what? Distance, or is it distance squared? It's distance squared. Just like that. Just like that, right? So this is the exact same thing. We're talking about ions of a different charge. So we're talking about Coulombic attraction. Therefore, you should see something that should drop off, right, as one over R squared, right? So let's draw it. It's gonna look something like this, okay? Therefore, if you were to combine these two together, and this is where it gets tricky, what should it look like? If you were to combine these two together, you've got your attractive force, your negative force, what will it look like? A decaying sine wave. A decaying sine wave, absolutely right. It looks like a damp sine wave, right? It's gonna increase at first, because the repulsive force is really, really strong, right? So at low, at small values of R, repulsion dominates, but then eventually the attraction dominates. And that at infinity, that goes to zero. Meaning if you take two atoms, say a sodium plus and chlorine minus, salt, sodium chloride is just salt, right? You take those two ions and they're infinitely far apart, they experience no attraction to each other. It goes to zero. There's no force of attraction or repulsion. They just don't see each other. As you bring them closer and closer and closer, they initially start to feel an acceleration to draw even closer together, right? And, and at some point they're gonna reach a maximum force, right? At some, at some separation distance, they feel a maximum force to be drawn together. And then it's going to reach a zero force where there's nothing. And if you try and squish them together after that, they start to experience a repulsion. This makes sense? How are we doing on time? Got 10 minutes. We're good. So this is, because of this, we can start to now finally talk about things that we care about in material science. And this is our first thing right here, that distance from there to there. We call this the bond length. sometimes also called the equilibrium separation distance, right? Where is that? Um, like? It corresponds to the value when F oh. equals zero. When your F net, your net force, right? When your net force is equal to zero, that's when you have your bond length, right? If there's no force acting on it, it's not gonna move anywhere, it's gonna stay put, right? I should label these, this is your attractive, which is the same as this guy, Coulomb's law. And then this over here is repulsion, repulsive force, okay? Any questions on this? Can I clarify it at all in any way? So it's useful to think about in terms of forces. Now we're gonna to turn to energy, but real quick, Shikara. Sorry, so is the repulsive just the negative of the Coulomb? No, it's not the same, because they have a different R dependence. The attractive has a R dependence. It depends on R as a function of one over R squared. This has, this would be like um, R to a higher power. It's negative, but it's R to a higher power. So meaning at, at small separation, repulsion dominates. That's why you can never, you never have atoms collapsing into one another and you know, nuclear fission occurring, right? That's, you have to overcome this repulsive force, which is enormous, right? Because a lot of poly exclusion principle happening, okay? So when do you reach equilibrium? If I just told you F net equals zero, right? That's when equilibrium occurs. All we have to do is find an expression for our forces, right? Set it equal to zero, solve for R, and we would have our equilibrium separation, right? So again, F net, equals F A, F attractive, plus F R, our repulsive force. And when that equals zero, that is at equilibrium. Right? Like a, a hockey puck on ice, if nothing's touching it, it just stays put. But if I'm pushing that hockey puck, it's just gonna keep on moving as long as I'm pushing it, right? And when you actually hit it with a stick, it slides, but it's still experiencing a force on it a coefficient of drag, right, from the ice and the air, so it's, it has a drag force, and eventually when that's set to zero, it'll stop too, right? Ice makes it go further than carpet, but it'll still stop eventually. So now, how is force related to energy? Anybody remember from physics, how does force and energy relate one with another? 
Force and energy, how are they related? Uh, energy equals integral of force, DR. Yes, FDR, like the president. Energy equals the integral of FDR, right? Or another way of writing this is that force, sorry, that is a funky E. F equals the derivative of energy, DE, DR. Both of these statements are true. So, in the time that we have left, five minutes, if you were going to draw this, let me try and draw it on the same axis. Now we're going to draw energy, and we're going to draw it against, just like before, R, our interatomic separation distance. What should the energy picture look like? Well, from this, anybody want to be bold and try this? Remember what you know about integrals and derivatives, right? The derivative of a function, right? If your function is, uh, say, f, and, uh, no, sorry, let's say e, because we're going to take the derivative of e, right? So energy, if you take the derivative of e with respect to r, what does that tell you about the function energy, right? If it's negative, what does that tell you about the energy function? It's decreasing, right? If it's positive, then it's increasing, right? And then you remember zeros correspond to maximum and minima, right? So if you look at this, our net energy, right, right here, it is, when it's at a zero, that should be a maximum or a minimum of our energy. And just from what I've told you before about energy wanting to be minimized, do you think when F net is zero, is that a maximum or a minimum of energy? It's gonna be a minimum, right? The atoms don't wanna move because they're already in a happy place in terms of energy. They don't want, they, it's already as low as it can go, so they're not gonna move. So we know that at, at R naught, sorry, I should write that R naught is sometimes called the equilibrium separation. R with a little naught underneath it, a little zero. So that's our equilibrium bond distance. We know that we're gonna have a minimum. Let's just draw it right there, right? Now how do we know what else to draw? Well, everywhere left of this, left of R naught, what's happening in our force diagram? To the left of it, it's negative. Therefore, it must be decreasing. Our function energy must be decreasing, right? So let's draw it. Let's say it's going down to there. And then after that, it's going to be increasing the whole way because this never goes negative again. So it's going to continue increasing, but it's going to increase rapidly at first, and then it's going to have an inflection point that matches this right there. If you guys remember this from calculus, it'll have an inflection point and then it's going to tail off. So it ends up looking something kind of like this. This is the famous energy potential well, right? Looks kind of like a well, like a U. The potential well. This, believe it or not, as simple as this concept is, is extremely useful for describing a ton of the different uh, phenomenon that we observe. This tells us things about melting point. It tells us things about thermal expansion. It tells us things about uh, binding energy, right? All sorts of things. Anthony, question? So, pardon my ignorance, but what exactly is the difference between energy and force? Is energy just saying the potential of that bond to separate? So, I think I heard two questions there. First off, what's the difference between energy and force? Yeah. So, they fundamentally have different units, all right? If I, um, if I have this, this thing here, and I want to push it across the table, I have to, I have to apply a force of some number of newtons, and I have to push that for some distance, right? The longer I push it, the more energy I expend, right? So the same force, if I do that for a longer time, I expend more energy. So they're just fundamentally different that way. And then the other question I think I heard from you is, what's the difference between potential and energy? And those are the same thing. It's two words for the same thing. When we talk about a potential, it's really short for saying a potential energy. Does that make sense? Any other questions on this? Can I explain so far? So let me just say a couple more things. We're almost out of time. So let me just say that you can get coefficient of thermal expansion, stiffness, melting point, all these properties. How, do you, how would you get that? Let me ask you this. If you have two materials, let me draw another one, a different material, and it did something like this. Which one of these it has a higher melting point? Now, why do you think black? That's right. Why should black have a higher melting point? Anthony, you have a thought? Yep. Yep. 
to get out of its energy well, or to think of it this way, right? This is the equilibrium separation. When you melt something, you basically allow the atoms not only to separate a little bit, but to separate completely to the point where they can flow around and do what liquids do. So you separate them to infinity. And to overcome it, that means you have to drag it all the way that way. That means you have to overcome that whole distance here in terms of energy. So if something has a shallow potential energy well, then you didn't have to, it has a low melting point, right? To separate it infinitely far away, it didn't take very much energy. And we'll pick up here next time.